Welcome, bet riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. I'm so happy to have you guys with us today. We have a show that I think you will find of interest uh, with some good guests and lots of interesting things to talk about. So welcome. Let's uh, talk a little bit about what's coming up today. I've got uh, Brian Ball here with uh, the news. We've got some breaking news to share with you, and uh, that'll be coming up in a minute. We have Jasmine Reese, the trike riding violinist that we've been talking about online with us. Very excited to chat with her about what she does. We, uh, we have Peter Stahl, the bicycle man here with us. He's gonna talk about, uh, I think, mid drives uh, today. And Denny's gonna be here with the sports talking about uh, senior games uh, around the country, some that have uh, just taken place. And uh, I think a little bit about uh, what you can do to uh, participate where you are. So uh, that's what we have in store. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how you can help us uh, here at the Laid Back Bike Report by subscribing to our YouTube channel. So if you look down in the lower right, lower right hand corner, you're gonna see a little red subscribe button. Uh, if you wouldn't mind and you haven't already done so, please click that and, uh, and then hit the little notification bell that you see on the YouTube channel. And that way you'll get a little notification when we go live so you won't miss a thing that we do. And uh, if you look in the upper right hand corner, you're going to see a little white eye pop up and it uh, stands for information. It will lead you to our website. Uh, lots of information there about our show. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about what uh, the website has on it uh, towards the end of the show. But please click that uh, white eye when you have a chance and see what we are all about. Uh, we try to make this show as interactive as possible. And the way we do that is using YouTube live chat. Uh, we have that running for every show, and we always have a bunch of people on that get to interact with each other, with our panelists, and uh, with our guests, and occasionally with me if I have a little time during the show. So uh, please avail yourself of the live chat. If you are uh, watching on YouTube, you can look right over there to the right, and you'll see a window with that. If you're watching, uh, that's on a computer. If you happen to be watching uh, on mobile, which more and more people are, uh, I think you have to kind of scroll your screen up a little bit and you'll see below the live chat and you can participate that way. If you are on uh, Bent Rider or Twitter or Facebook, you can watch the show there. But if you want to participate in live chat, uh, look in the window and click on the uh, YouTube uh, uh, logo that you see there. It will take you to the YouTube channel directly and then you can jump on the live chat from there. So uh, ask questions, make comments, uh, talk amongst yourself, whatever you like to do. Uh, we uh, we would appreciate you uh, participating in the show that way. Today's show is sponsored by TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent, and Trailside.Bike, a fine recumbent bike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida, and Velocity, builders of performance wheels and rims and they're handmade in the USA. All right, so uh, let's jump to our panelists. I've mentioned them before. These are the, the guys that, that make this show possible, make it run as smoothly as it does, and the people I can blame when it doesn't. So let's start in Germany. Let's go to Salzgitter, Germany, where our director uh, and low-level tandem rider uh, is right now. It's Lars Kamm. Hello, Lars. Hey, folks. I'll take the blame any day. <laughs> and he usually does. All right, let's move along to Raymond, Mississippi, where our favorite media guy is. It's Trey Burgoyne. Hey, Trey. Hey, everybody. Great to be here. Burgoyne. 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 There we go. That's, I was uh, waiting for that. <laughs> there it is. And uh, that came from Rochester, New York, I believe, where we will find the founder and editor of Bent Rider and the anchor of the laid back news desk. It's Brian Ball. Hey, Brian. All right, Brian said hello. And then let's go to Sayre, Pennsylvania, where our laid back sports desk anchor is Denny Voorhees. Hey, Denny. Hey, how you doing? And, and I read Brian's lips and he said, hello. That's what I thought he said too. Yeah, he did. Thank you, thank you for that, Denny. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't think uh, that 
uh, Peter is quite ready yet, so we'll uh, we'll skip over Peter for right now and go to Colorado Springs, Colorado. He just landed a paying bike race official gig, I found out. It's Larry Seidman. Hey, Larry. Hello, everybody. Hi. Good to have you with us again, Larry. Now, let's, let's move along to Cold Spring, Kentucky. Uh, we're always wondering about him, and that's why he's known as the Bearded Wonder. It's Larry Varney. Hi. How you doing, Larry? Hi, everyone. I'm sitting here with my friend, getting ready to watch a very interesting show. So good to see everybody again. All right. And this and was next a time, really nice ride. Yeah, yeah. I heard that it was. And next time, Laurie, see if you can find a little trike for that dude. If you could, we'll we'll see what that looks like. So, all right, let's uh, let's go back to Brian and see what he's got uh, for us in the way of news. Brian, take it away. All right. Can you guys hear me? Okay. We can. Yay! All right. Cool. Uh, first up, we have some very cool news. A lot of this is two-wheeler news, so which is pretty exciting. You don't get that a whole lot lately. It's been all about trikes. But first of all, we have one of my favorite companies, Lightning, has updated their P38 model. Is the slide up? I can't see it on my screen. Is it up there? Trey, can you get that? Trey is trying. Hang on a second. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, so... I love the P30. I've owned four of them, and I'm probably about to own a fifth one. They've just made a lot of really cool changes. Primarily, the biggest change is they now are offering a, or not offering, it's standard now, carbon fiber fork on all of them, which is very cool that they've designed themselves. I'm not quite sure where it's sourced from. I assume it's from overseas, but very, very cool they made that change. And also, they are all coming with uh, hydraulic disc brakes now from Shimano, depending on which model you get, which level of brakes you get. Very, very cool upgrades for both the, and, and those are the standard brakes, by the way. No more calipers or V-brakes. They're all discs, which I think is a very good upgrade. My last P38 had discs, and it made a huge difference on the bike. Because the one problem the P38 had is the braking was always kind of iffy on them, just due to the design of the frame. The disc brakes solve all that. Pretty, pretty cool. Very happy to see all that. Can't wait to get my hands on one at RCC. Uh, next up, they also changed their Phantom slightly. Uh, the Phantom model is their less expensive model. If you can go to the next slide, I think I put one up there for that tray. Uh, yep, they, that is going to be available in a mid racer form now. That's not the one picture they didn't have a picture of it yet. The mid racer form, you can get that on the P38 also. Uh, basically, just has a uh, carbon fiber low or seat, you know, like a hard shell seat. So it just lowers the height a bit. They call it the mid racer. It's a pretty cool setup. Does allow you to get your feet down lower, allows you to lay back more. Lightnings are designed pretty much to be ridden in a very upright seat position. That's kind of a love it or hate it thing. So this gives you another option if you want to be a bit more laid back. Uh, next up, we have Cruise Bike. Cruise Bike is launching a new S40. That is not the picture of the S40 because as Cruise Bike is off to do, they are being a bit secretive and cool about it, which I think it's kind of fun the way they launch their stuff. Uh, it's going to be launching on September 18th. You can go to their website now, cruisebike.com, and you can sign up to be alerted when it's available to order. Primary changes, it looks like, from the little teaser photo is it's green, and I think there's some component changes. I don't know if there's any other major changes on the bike. They like to trickle stuff out and keep you interested. I think that's kind of cool. Speaking of keeping you interested, this is our big breaking news. I wish we had a little breaking news intro. Da, 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 da. The Cheta made a little change to their website yesterday, and some people noticed it. The arrows there point to it. Look at that, recumbent bikes and trikes. They've never offered a trike before. There's no information on a model or anything like that on the site. They just Their header just changed to recumbent bikes and trikes, and the collective recumbent community is justifiably losing their tiny little minds over it. So uh, can't wait to see what that is. I'm hoping they have something at RCC. They're showing a new trike or something like that. I hope this isn't just a, a troll. I, I don't think they would do that. But uh, I tried to get a hold of them, but it's the weekend. I couldn't really get a hold of anybody to really get any uh, down low on that. But as soon as I can, it'll be up at Bent Rider, and, and you'll be able to find out more about it. Yeah, curiously timed, though, and uh, with uh, with CycleCon coming up in just a, a couple of months, Brian, I, I got to believe. Yeah, they got to be. They got to be bringing something. Yeah, I would think so, too. They just too. have to be. Very interesting, though, to, to see that. So, all right. Is that yeah. it for you today, Brian? That's it for me. Very nice. Interesting stuff. So, thank you very much. Uh, Brian Ball from Bent Rider with the news today. All right, folks. 
Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, today's guest by summarizing her story as just another girl and her dog touring on a trike while playing the violin. I know you've heard this tale a hundred times, but this time is different. We're going to interview the dog. Bent Riders, I'd like you all to meet Fiji and her trike riding chauffeur, Jasmine Reese. Hello, Fiji and Jasmine. <laughs> Hi, and uh, don't forget to unmute yourself because we can't hear Fiji bark, Jasmine. Uh, I, wish she, I wish she would bark. <laughs> oh, I thought you had her com on command uh, doing a little hello <laughs> for us. So. No, no. I had to bribe her to, to sit here today and uh, because she's a little diva and she she knows when a camera's on. And so she's she, she just, she automatically knows to steer clear. So I've been bribing her with baloney and, and she's doing really well. Yeah, well, it's good to see her. And bribing with baloney, I think is a great idea. It works for me uh, a lot. So uh, that's, that's good. All right, well, it's good to see you, Fiji. And uh, I think we'll just talk to your chauffeur now for a while, but you're welcome to jump back. Oh, look how sweet. She'll, she'll jump back in whenever. So, all right, uh, Jasmine, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, about you and, and what you do. First of all, why don't you tell us uh, where you are right now? I'm in Texas. Um, I'm actually helping my mom out for a few, I've been here for about a month and um, she's taking care of my grandmother who has dementia. So I've been here helping out and, uh, and that's quite a project. And of course, Texas is really hot too. So it's been, uh, it's interesting, but I'm in East Texas, which is uh, about two hours East of Dallas. So it's lots of forest and it's just very humid and beautiful, but humid. <laughs> this time of year, for sure. All right, yes. let's, uh, you know, I introduced you and talked about you being a violinist. <laughs> so I think what I'd like to do is start uh, with your musical background. Can you tell us a little bit about your musical background? Yeah. Um, so let's see. I started violin when I was 14, which is considered a little bit late in the classical music world. And um, from from that age on, I pretty much... I, I flew with the violin. I knew I was in love right away. And um, I went around calling or I called all of these teachers around in my town. And I said, is there anything I can do in exchange for violin lessons? And so um, what I did was, I like that picture. What I did was, was I uh, started babysitting in exchange for lessons with my first teacher, Julissa Bosman in uh, California. And uh, I did that for a couple of years, made my way up into the advanced orchestras because I didn't want to sit with the little kids anymore. I wanted to be with kids my own age. So I made my way up to the advanced or orchestra and, and then came time to decide with college. I graduated high school at 15. So I had to, I didn't have much time between when I started violin to decide whether I wanted to go to music school because only playing for a year, I definitely wasn't at the level that kids going to music school where they, they were at a higher level. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, uh, yeah, so I just uh, decided to take a year off, try to get a little bit more in, you know, advanced, but I didn't do that because I had to, I didn't want to put college off too soon. So I went to college and I did prerequisites for pre-med and, and, um, and, uh, and I did take music courses with the idea that after I finished my prerequisites, I would audition for music school. And I just, I never did. And I, and I think that's one of my biggest regrets in life is that I didn't go to music school like I should have, or like I, like I really wanted to. And, um, and so I continued in college and, and then of course everything kind of derailed when, uh, I started, uh, when I started to experience signs of depression, major depression while I was in college, and I completely changed course, and then I quit violin for a little while. And then of course, uh, cycling happened at some point in there, and violin came back into the picture at some point in there, which I'm sure we'll go over <laughs> soon. Right, we're gonna, we're gonna, you're, it's a little bit ahead of the game here. We'll get, we'll get back <laughs> to that. So, all right. Um, let me see here. Let's, if we can talk a little bit about, a little bit more about music. Um, when you're writing, we'll just uh, start from kind of the beginning of when you started writing. We'll get to how you did all that. But I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, do you listen to music when you're writing? I don't very often because I don't have many electronics with me and my phone is the only thing I can listen to. And, and I want to save the battery just in case there's an emergency and I need to make an emergency call. But there was one 
ride in particular, I think it was actually in Texas. Yeah, I was. I was riding in Texas in 2016 and I started listening to Box Partitas because I had downloaded this app and I could play that and it didn't drain too much battery. So I, I, I was listening to Bach and for some reason, the solo sonatas and partitas give me that boost I need to, to keep pedaling. I don't know why. You would think it would be like dubstep or some type of boom, 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 boom music, but no, it's just the Bach, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I can keep going now. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, and you know, this is something that, that has occurred to me from time to time when I'm riding. Um, I kind of feel rhythms and, and sounds of, of the ride itself. And I'm wondering, if, to a musician like yourself, um, that must happen all the time. So when you're riding, when you're on the road and you're pedaling and hearing clickety clacks and the things that we all hear and feel, um, what do you experience? How do you experience that as a musician? Do you, do you incorporate that into what you do as a musician? No, and it's really interesting you would say that. I don't really listen to the sound of the bike so much as I do everything else around me. I think one of the big things that I listen to is the sounds of cars. And um, I think I have a couple of videos, which I they're so far back that it would be hard to find them. But there will be a car that will pass by and I'll start making a song and singing like, oh, when the saints go marching in. There's a video of me doing that. And, and I just I like to sing along to cars and to nature and things like that. But I don't really establish a rhythm with pedaling. I think because I start my trips out so out of shape, I try to distract myself from what's going on with the bike and, and especially pedaling. If I bring too much attention to the rhythm of pedaling, it becomes more mental where I'm like, oh man, I can't do this. So I try to distract away from that and listen to everything but. So that's really a good question because uh, I never really thought about the bike so much because I'm so I'm trying to distract myself from it. Right, so I can right. For going long distances. Going. Yeah, yeah. For going long distances, you have to do it in one way or another. Mm -hmm. All right, let's let's start talking more about the bike and how this came into play. I'm interested in knowing how you began touring on a on a bike with Fiji in the first place. What tell me that story. What happened? Okay. So I'll try to make it as short as possible because it's it's not really a long story, but it's it's long. So as I said, when I was in college, I started to have that depression and I pretty much quit everything, uh, violin, school, religion. I was pretty much a hermit in my room and became the complete opposite of who I had been previously. I gained about 70 to 100 pounds and, um, and I was just isolating myself from people. I used to be not so much extroverted, but I was way more social than prior to depression. And, um, and it got to a point where I was spending over 20 hours each day in my room and just not wanting to interact with the world. And so um, the first change for me was Fiji. I rescued her, not for myself, but for my mom. She was supposed to be a gift <laughs> for my mom. And uh, that completely did not happen. Uh, Fiji chose me and she followed me all around the house, would not even pay my mom any attention. And so she became my dog which was kind of uh, inconveniencing for me at the time because I knew one, I didn't have the time and the time wasn't really so much that I didn't have the time. It was the, the motivation and the will to really take care of a dog. So I had to come out of this depressed mood that I was in and, um, and work up the, the will to walk her and to take care of her and to feed her and to work in order to feed her and things like that. So, so that kind of, that was the first coming out of this darkness that I was in. And then, um, and then I wanted to do more because I still wasn't really active. I tried to join the gym when, when I had Fiji so that I could walk her more. And, um, and I just hated the gym because there's too many people around. And I didn't feel like the machines were really doing anything for me. So uh, I saw my mom's Walmart bicycle in the garage and it, was being, it wasn't being used. And I said, you know what? That might actually be a, a good exercise. It would force me to get out of the house and I'd be exercising at the same time. So uh are you do you still see me <laughs> yeah well yeah uh, trey can we go to the ne there's another slide here if you can can you go to the next slide there there we go We're yeah. just kind of, that's what i mean <laughs> no I, I thought maybe my video cut off but i forgot that you guys do the pictures too so that's great yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um go ahead yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so um so yeah so i said that that would force me to get out of the house so i started bicycling to school i was trying to do a last attempt to try to get myself back into school so i would bicycle about seven miles and there would be this 
horrible hill that I had to go up every day and I would always walk it. And then one day I finally rode up the entire hill and I was so proud of myself. And that's when I asked myself the question, I wonder how far you can go on a bicycle. And then from there, it just, it was pretty quick. I, I went on Facebook that night and I wasn't even searching for it, but I saw this advertisement for adventure cycling. And there was all these stories about people who had toured cross country. And I pretty much made the decision right then and there that I was going to run away <laughs> on a bicycle. And, um, and also pretty quickly said, well, okay, it takes about three months to bicycle across the country. According to the stories I'm reading, I'm not leaving Fiji for that long. So she's coming with me and, and that's kind of how that, yeah, and that, that picture there is our preparation. It's when I started uh, finally attaching Fiji. Uh, this company here sent me the bike leash attachment. Uh, their name was Springer America and I think they still sell these. And um, that was the first bike leash attachment that I had for Fiji and uh, started putting her on the bike and doing these little rides. And, and yeah, it was wonderful. That's how it all began. That's how it all began. Okay. So now, uh, I guess, uh, how long ago was that? When, when did this that, all begin? That was in 2013. So 2012 is when I started attempting to ride the bike. And, um, and then right, it was like the end of 2012. And then 2013, January is when I made the, the decision to bicycle across the country. And I left in May of that year. And then you did bicycle across the country. I did. On your upright <laughs> bike. Uh, and, yes. Yep. Yeah, and there, there you go. So now, was that pretty much your setup there at that point? Oh uh, no, this was in Ohio. I had gotten rid of a few things, and I did not have my violin with me. I actually, my mom drove me to New York to start my trip because we were in Columbia, Missouri at the time. So she drove me to New York to start my trip, and I get, I handed her my violin because it was raining. It was pouring rain. And I didn't know how to protect my instrument at that point. And I said, well, maybe this isn't a good idea because I didn't bring anything to wrap my violin in. So, um, so I didn't have my violin. I also had this large cooler on the top of the, the trailer. If you go back to that one picture, on top of Fiji's trailer, I had this large, <laughs> this large uh, cooler where I had food and things like that in there. And then I had more stuff on top of there. It was a crazy. And then I had the, the panniers were a lot fatter. And then I had something on top of that back rack as well of the, of the panniers. And then I had that backpack still, which was even more full. It was horrible. I had so much weight when I started. And, um, and when I, so it's a off, learning experience, right? I oh, mean, that's yeah. what everybody <laughs> seems to go through. It's like yeah, exactly. you know, you start out, you're not in shape and you don't know what you're doing. And then I suppose that first, uh, that first trip across the country uh, was one in which you learned a great deal about touring and what you wanted to do. Is that the case? Well, yeah. And I think I was more so just learning about myself. The biggest thing for me was, was trying to, I didn't know why I, ha I didn't know at the time what I was going through. I just thought I became lazy or I didn't know it was depression. So I was really on that trip trying to figure out how do I get back to the person that I was prior? How do I become that motivated, energetic person that I was prior? So, so I was trying to push myself, push myself and, and really learn how to be patient and, and keep pushing forward, even with all the thoughts in my mind telling me I couldn't do it. So, um, <laughs> so that was really the learning experience for me. It wasn't so much about touring or about the bike because I think I did so many things wrong. I didn't know how to change. A I didn't know how to change tires. I didn't know how to anything about bike maintenance. I didn't know what the proper cadence was for pedaling. I didn't know what, um, I didn't even know about the bicycle height. I, I started out with the wrong bicycle height. And when I reached Ohio, actually, that picture, I was having terrible knee pain. And um, I had to see a couple of people who, uh, they were very nice. They were warm showers hosts who took me into their homes. And one was a massage therapist and the other one was an acupuncturist and they helped me with my knees. So yeah, so there was lots of things that I did wrong. And so I wasn't really thinking about the touring aspect right. so of it. So you didn't know so much about what you were doing as far as biking. But what yeah. you did know is what you needed, it sounds like, uh, yeah. to, to, for yourself and yeah. what you needed to, to progress and help yourself. So um, I guess uh, so you completed this tour. I, I want to transition now into how you went from uh, the upright uh, uh, bike to uh, what you're riding right now. Tell me about yeah. the this transition and what you're riding now. Uh, so I am riding an ICE uh, Adventure HD trike. 
And um, basically I did the first tour across the country in 2013. I had the knee problems. And then the 2016 tour I did across Canada, I had uh, elbow and shoulder problems. And it was because of all the weight that's just bearing down. I'm writing, sometimes I was writing 10, 12 hours a day and I'm just, you know, putting all this weight on the bike. So I started to have those problems. And for me, that was a big no-no because I play violin. So um, so I started researching other ways in which I can still travel the world. And I still wanted it to be human powered. I didn't want to go for a truck or a motorcycle and things like that. And um, so I saw some other trike uh, trikers who had been touring and, and that's when this, this came about. And I, I contacted Ice Trikes and they were wonderful enough to sponsor uh, a trike and they sent it to me. And, um, and yeah, and I've been riding that ever since and I, I love it so far. It's so comfortable. I don't have elbow and shoulder pain anymore. And um, the so only this thing will that be I'm, the future. This will be. The, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, the only thing that I'm getting used to is is the speed is different. I I had b b gotten so in shape with the upright bicycle, and I was going such a, a fast speed at at some point where I could do like 75 miles in a day. Whereas the trike is a whole different ball game. So now I'm kind of down to where I started on the bike was 25, 30 miles a day. And that's what you do. So, all right. So that's interesting about the trike. And then you, so you have this combination of, of the trike and the trailer. Can you tell us a little bit more about the rest of the setup here? So tell us, uh, uh, Trey, you had that picture of the trailer up. I don't know if that's exactly what you're still using, yeah. but I thought that was there. Tell us about this. Yeah. So this is a cycle tote uh, dog trailer. It's specifically made for, for uh, hauling your, your pup. And, um, and I wanted this because I had actually used it on the upright bike and it's so, I mean, I haven't had any problems with it. No mechanical problems whatsoever. It's just so sturdy. I also like the fact that it hitches to the top of the rack, the rear rack, as opposed to the, the wheel. Um, because when Fiji would stand in her trailer, she would push down on the front of it and the, the tow bar. So if you see here in this picture, you can see how the, the tow bar is attached to the actual rack. There's a hitch attachment there. So yeah, it, she would stand on the other trailer and the tow bar began to bend to the ground so much so that we would catch on things in the road, like a, the sewer tops and I'd go flying off the bike. It was horrible. I did that a few times actually. So, um, so I, I like this one because she sits at the very edge and it doesn't bend because it's attached to the top. Um, and then I kind of created a, a, a different, there's no rack at the top. So I put this refrigerator rack at the top of it with bungee cords and zip ties. And then I started to uh, put things on top of that. So I have her sleeping bag and my sleeping bag and our sleeping pads and our tent up there. And um, I also put her food up there, which is not pictured here, but I put her food up there as well. And um, and then of so, course I have a sign. <laughs> so somewhere there's a refrigerator without a rack in it that people are trying to put their catch up <laughs> in that's falling through. So we want, we want to figure out probably where that is we're talking about. But no, if I can no, interrupt, for, I, I just want to interrupt for just a second. And I want to remind folks about the live chat. And as we continue uh, with Jasmine, if you have questions uh, for her about her uh, depression, about her uh, trike, uh, about her tours, uh, feel free to jump on the live chat and uh, pop your questions in there. And I'll try to uh, get those to her as we continue this interview. All right. So, Jasmine, um, you talked uh, a little bit about uh, about uh, Fiji coming along in that in that trailer. So I want to talk more specifically about what it's like to uh, tour with with a dog uh, on a trike. That's something that's uh, pretty unusual. I, I know of a few people I've seen with maybe smaller dogs, but Fiji is not necessarily the smallest dog I've ever seen. So tell me what it's like to uh, to tour with your dog. Um, yeah, so it's it's great. I mean, as people know, as I pointed out earlier in the interview, she is she's kind of more of a, I don't know, she's my emotional rescue. She really came through for me at a dark time. So I think I, I couldn't imagine touring without her. And she's kind of that that dog that gets me through a really bad day and um, does something silly or something wonderful that just helps me to keep going. So um, so that's kind of what she means to me on a tour. But there are lots of things that I have to do when I'm touring with her, such as carry 14 pound bags of food, and <laughs> which adds a lot of weight. And she thankfully is a dog that 
is athletic enough where she can run for a good portion of the day with lots of breaks and lots of water. Um, so I don't have to pull her as much, but as she gets older, I am pulling her a lot more. And she's about 55 pounds, um, which is not terrible, but once you put her in the, tra the trailer, you definitely feel the difference on top of everything else that I'm carrying. When, once she goes in the trailer, I'm probably hauling about 175 pounds worth of stuff. And um, going up a mountain, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's hard. I can't imagine why you talked about slowing down uh, on the strike tour, <laughs> obviously <laughs> with all that extra weight. How about, um, how about uh, Fiji's reaction to your music? So uh, what happens when, uh, does, does she love your violin? Does she, does she ignore it? What's, what's that about? It's, like I said, she's the dog who's motivated me to do everything. She's the only dog that I've had that hasn't howled when I play. <laughs> she actually sits right up under my feet and she'll stay there the whole time while I'm playing violin. It's as if she's encouraging me. Jasmine, keep going. You can do it. Don't give up on your dreams. She's she's the, the best dog for everything. She encourages me for cycling. She encourages me for music. I, I can't imagine life without her. She's just a great dog. <laughs> All right. That's, that's great. All right. Let me ask you this. Um, you're, you've got, you go on extended tours and uh, go across the country for, uh, I assume months at a time. I'm sure people are curious about how you support yourself when you do this. Is this something that's sustainable? So if you, uh, if people are watching and, and they may want to take on a tour like you're doing for whatever personal reasons they may have, um, yeah. is this a sustainable type of thing? How do you do it? Um, I think it's a constant, uh, what's the best answer? It's constantly worrying about where you're going to stay, what you're going to eat, and, um, and, and then kind of learning to trust the universe that it will provide. However, that doesn't, that's not sustainable whatsoever. Um, you know, I think it's pure luck that, that it works out for a little while. And then I had to decide, okay, if I'm going to con continue to do this, I need to think of better ways to do this where where I'm not worrying so much. So that's where social media came in and uh, work away. Work away is this website where you can work in exchange for food and board. And then of course I started getting jobs on the road. So I, I had to come up with a model for my travel, which is, it's not about how fast I'm going. It's about what I can do to keep living this way. So I'll stop in a place for however long I need to, whether it be a few weeks or whatnot, to complete a job. And then I'll have enough money to complete the next section of my trip. And then if I need to stop again to make more money and then complete another section of my trip, then I then I continue to do that. And now with violin, now that I'm a little bit more confident, you know, because confidence was a big issue for me, but now that with violin, I can start to get gigs and I do how I've done house concerts and I've made good chunks of change from the house concerts. And so this has been kind of growing on the road for me in the monetary aspect as well and trying to become more self-sufficient and making money in, in not just odd jobs, but also making money in the things that I want to do. So for violin is the big thing. And now that I'm making money off of some house concerts and presenting at schools and playing violin at schools, that's that's wonderful. But it, it takes time. You have to, if you want to to go on a tour like this and a long-term tour, you have to think about how it is going to be sustainable. And if you can mix something that you love um, with cycling, that's great. If you're an artist or if you're an engineer and there's something you can do along the way to continue making money, that in that way it could become sustainable. Very, very practical, uh, very, very practical answer to that question. Uh, that's that's really good to hear. And I'd never heard of Workaway, so uh, I think we'll link to that uh, in the description of the video. That's an interesting aspect of how you proceed as well. So we will link to that as well. There's, there's several there's several different types of websites like that. Workaway, Help Exchange. I would uh, not just Workaway, but there's if you just do like work work exchange websites, you'll find a whole bunch. Uh, the other one is Wolf, which is farming, sustainable farming. So you help farmers uh, in exchange for room and board and food, which is also a great one because farmers really need help right now. So if people want to work on farms in exchange, you'll be doing this country and other countries around the world. It's international, a, a great favor. Very interesting. All right, let's jump to the uh, chat. I've got a question from Jeffrey Fry. He says, I heard you on pedal shift before I rode across America on my trike, and now I have the privilege of hearing you again. 
I found it difficult to get my trike into hotel rooms. How do you manage that? <laughs> That's been a learning experience. It's really hard. I have to detach Fiji's trailer, and then I have to trust that no one's going to steal the trailer while I, while I run Fiji and the trailer back to the hotel room. And then I have to, like, maneuver. It depends on the size of the door. Usually, if I am in a hotel room, I don't stay in hotels often, but if I am, I try to tell them, uh, do you have a room that has a door wide enough to fit a wheelchair or something like that? And they'll say, yeah, we do, and, and that helps. But if it's not that kind of door, then I'm like sitting there trying to turn the trike this way and moving it in. And then I have to run back to the front, grab the dog trailer and run that back and then put that in the room as well. So so I haven't come up with an easy method. It's it's probably just as hard as, as you have experienced as well. <laughs> All right. Um, also from our friends, Julie and Mark Lovegrove in, uh, in the UK, she says, um, hi, Jasmine, enjoying hearing your story. You're a great speaker. Uh, where are you planning on touring next? And that's actually leading into uh, uh, my next set of questions. I want to find out about your plans. And I know we've talked uh, earlier, and uh, you're not always real big on plans. So let's let's start with this, and 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 tell me about uh, when you get back on the road. I guess when do you plan on doing that, and and what are your immediate plans? And then we'll talk about long term. Yeah. So thank you for that question. Um, yeah. So right now the the plan is waiting out the summer. I've figured out that I don't do heat well, so I. I have stopped for the summer and Fiji doesn't do heat well. It's mostly because of Fiji. So October when fall sets in is when I'll get back on the road. And my idea is to finish Route 66 to California. And then I'm going to be in California for a few months because I'll be playing the Bach double violin concerto with um, an orchestra there in San Jose, which I will announce that on my page at some point. And um, so you're hearing it first here. And uh, so I'll be doing that in March. And, and I, I do want to go down into Mexico and South America. However, it's going to be hot again in March. So if I leave from California at that time to go into Mexico, that's their summer. And I hear that the heat is just unbelievable in those countries. So I haven't decided whether I'm going to go down to Mexico or if I'm going to go um, up to Canada, which it'll start to be summer around March or may, maybe April, something like that. Go back up to Canada and do some of the uh, provinces that I didn't get to do before, which is um, Newfoundland and Labrador. And then I did go to Halifax, but I also want to see Cape Breton. When I got to Cape Breton the last time, it was flooded due to the hurricane that occurred in 2016. I think it was Hurricane Andrew. So um, so I want to go back up there. But I haven't decided on that yet because, you know, I don't plan things. So we'll see. <laughs> right. That's the impression that I got. So those uh, those lines you saw on that map, they can, they're kind of wiggly and they could go in any direction. So exactly. You, you stay tuned to your uh, face, Facebook page and, and people will be able to follow where you are at any uh, given time. Um, so... Uh, you know, I've I've had a, a few other women uh, trike tours on the show, and uh, I always ask this question because everybody wants to know: Are you worried about the dangers that you might encounter while you are on the road as uh, a woman traveling alone? T could you tell us what your feelings are about that? Uh, no more. I'm no more worried about it than when I'm at, you know, in a stable, you know, place. I'm no more worried about it than I am in that environment. To me, it's just like I'm taking a bicycle ride in my neighborhood each day to some other neighborhood, and, and then I happen to make that place my home for the night. And then I'm just riding from my home again and going to another home the next night. It's, it's not, I don't really worry too much. And, and from what I've seen with people, people have been amazingly kind, amazingly wonderful, and, and so I don't really fear people. Um, I don't fear traffic as much anymore, except d depends on what road I'm, I'm on. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't have that fear. I think if you had fear, you couldn't really do a lot of things in life. So, um, so I try to quell any fears. Usually if I do have any fear, it has more to do with, uh, am I going to have enough cash to feed Fiji? And usually I do. <laughs> so, so that's, that's okay. Fiji usually, she's, She's usually fed before I'm ever fed or ever think about eating. So uh, as long as she's fed, then then I'm good. <laughs> you you got to have baloney money, I, I guess, is, uh, is yeah. what you can summarize that as. 
All right, let's let's look at the the big picture here. Um, what are you trying to accomplish when you're on the road like this? It's uh, you've you've already talked about some of this. So clearly, it's a mental health uh, therapy for you that seems to work very well. Mm -hmm. And the music, your music is so important to you. Uh, and you have these collaborations uh, that that you're trying to uh, accomplish as you go, and that means a lot to you too. Uh, so overall, is is that really what you are? Those two things that you're trying to accomplish, or are there other things you're trying to accomplish with this? There are many other things I want to accomplish. So I I don't just think about you know I don't really have plans, but I do think about what happens when this is all over. For example, I know that when Fiji, and I hate to even think about it now, even though it's very far from now, but when she does pass from old age, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure what that'll look like for me. I'm not sure if I'll be able to continue touring. And so I'll need to find another outlet. Um, and, and there are things that I really want to do, which is to start my own community music program and um, to kind of start this musical land that incorporates cycling and music in some way. So, um, so I've been looking at different. Yeah, small what, I'm sorry. What, what you want to start a musical land, a musical land, just like a, a, a I, I want to have property and I want to devote it all to music, everything, music, there'll be concerts, there'll be camps, retreats. And, um, and, and if I can incorporate cycling into that in some way, I would love to do that. So, uh, that, that is a dream that I have for that is just a little egg right now. And hopefully it'll become something bigger in the future. Right. Well, you, that's right into what you're going to do when you're done, which I was going to ask that near the end. So <laughs> you're a great answer. That's that's really interesting. We'll have to see what happens with that. All right. Um, let's let's talk about uh, some some favorites of yours. I thought we jumped to a few items uh, as much traveling uh, and touring as you've done on upright and, and trikes uh, around the country in Canada. I know you've had a ton of experiences and probably a ton of stories that you could, could tell. But I wanted to ask you a few favorites. So if you could, tell me about the favorite town or city that you visited. Um, I, I don't have a favorite town or city. I be, and there's a big reason for that because I feel like if I get attached to a place, then I won't want to leave it. So I don't ever really explore a place well enough to, to form any attachments. However, I will say the last place that I did love enough, I settled in for two years and that was Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> and, and so Indianapolis, and the only reason I liked it, well, no, that's not true. I liked it for a lot of reasons. They were really nice people. I liked the structure of downtown, but I stayed with a warm showers host there and she took me to Sub-Zero ice cream on Massachusetts, Massachusetts Avenue in, uh, in, uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I had that ice cream and I said, I'm coming back here. <laughs> Jasmine, I swear you are reading my interview questions before I get to them because I was going to ask you next what your favorite place to eat was, and you've already jumped that question. So, Sub zero. There you go, folks. If you're in Indianapolis, just down the road from me, not too far, I might have to try that. All right. Um, now let's jump to the music a little bit. So you've had a number of musical collaborations. I want to know about your favorite musical collaboration so far. Mm. Oh, that's a that's another one that's hard to narrow down a favorite because uh because everyone I've worked with has been just amazing um and I've learned so much from everyone. So I don't I don't think I have any favorites for musical collaborations. They've been all pretty pretty great. Although, okay, I will point out one. This isn't a favorite, but it's it's the most unique. I was stranded in this small town in Kansas called Coolidge, Kansas. And um it has 96 people there. And it just so happened that the guy who sang that song, In the Jungle, the Mighty Jungle, he lives there. In this the guy with that real high voice? That yeah. Goes, oh. Yeah, okay. So he lives there. And we had this little house concert thing where him and his wife came over. His wife was a concert pianist. And his wife came over and, uh, and we, yeah, it was, it was a night of music. I can't believe it. I was like, this... He lives in this small town. It's 96 people. I don't know if he still lives there. It's been five years. But yeah. So I thought that was really interesting that you find amazing people in these really small towns across the country. And, and just there's like so much happening in, in these towns that seems like there's nothing going on. But there's so much going on. Really interesting. All right. And then the last favorite. If you could tell me 
what's the best interview experience you've ever had? Oh, best interview experience? Oh, I don't know if I've had enough interviews to, well, I, once again, this isn't a favorite, but um, there was an interview where Fiji didn't like the cameraman because she doesn't like cameras. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't put a favorite. This this is going really well, by the way. <laughs> oh, oh you, you might say this has been your best experience so far then. Yeah, there's, this is going really well, but I will say that Fiji was kind of a crazy diva for this one guy. And, um, and no, yeah, yeah, and she hates cameras. So she tried to pull the camera out of his hand the whole time. And by the end of it, they were big buddies. So I would say that was probably Fiji's favorite. <laughs> well, that's the important thing, I think. So no one will accuse me of asking leading questions, I'm sure. So, all right, let's uh, let's go. So, um, yeah, I guess we were going to ask you about when you're done touring. You've already answered that. So I think we're kind of done with that part. I guess at this point, I would ask you, um, what would you like our audience to know? Maybe something that I haven't asked so far. What What would you like our audience to know about you that I haven't asked you? Oh, that you know, actually, there is something I want to uh, to bring out. I wanted to bring out that depression is still a constant struggle for me. I would say that cycling is is is, is a wonderful suppressant. It's not a cure. And therefore, if anyone out there is suffering from depression and you think you can just get on a bicycle like I did and go and, and you're going to have this amazing experience and your depression is going to be cured or whatever the case, that is not at all how it works. And that is not what I am advocating or telling people to do. Um, you have to find the activity or the person or the, or the animal or whatever the case may be that is the will and motivation you need to get up and, and fight against this terrible disease. Um, but for me, I would like to say that it is a constant fight, but I am so happy that I found an activity that makes me happy. It's I'm happy most of the time and sad with some sad moments thrown in. Whereas my life prior to that was, I was sad most of the time with some had happy moments thrown in. So I want people to know that you just need to find a way to be happy most of the time. You can't avoid sadness. There's, it's gonna happen every once in a while, but if your main goal is to create as many happy moments as possible and to fight every day to wake up and think about how am I going to make my day, how am I going to make each moment as happy as it possibly can be, that is that is what you need to do. And that's what I, I'm constantly thinking about and constantly doing as well. So that is just a wonderful wrap up to the interview. Uh, that's very inspiring. And uh, you are an inspiring person, I think, Jasmine, to so many people. I wanted to thank you so much for uh, coming on and sharing some uh, of your thoughts and your time with us. It's uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, if you. you could if you could tell tell folks, I'm going to put things in the link uh, in the in the links below in the description of this video. Tell people where they can follow you, where they can find you uh, online. Yeah. Um, so there's actually quite a few projects that I have going. Uh, please go to my website, fijapaw.com, F-I-J-A-P-A-W.com. I'm doing house concerts across the country. I'm doing school presentations. Um, I'm visiting community music schools to get ideas for the one that I want to start in the future. So if you are a person connected to your community and you want me to present at your school or to do a house concert, please contact me. Even if I'm not coming in your area, I might be willing to get to you somehow if, if you can provide a big venue. So please contact me if you want me to come up there and speak or, or to play. Um, I'd be happy to do that. And you can contact me on fijapaw.com. And of course, uh, my website includes all of my other social media where you can follow me on Facebook. Uh, and mostly Facebook and Instagram is where I am. So Super. Those will all be in the description uh, below the video, folks, on YouTube. Uh, Jasmine, uh, such uh, a pleasure having you on. I hope uh, you enjoyed your experience here. Thanks for coming on the Laid Back Bike Report. Thank you. I did enjoy my experience. You're you're uh, now one of my favorites. <laughs> we had to complete it first, I know, before we could even get there. So, Jasmine, stick with us if you like. If you have time, you're welcome to, to stick through the rest of the show. And uh, if uh, any comments or whatever come to your mind, you're welcome to contribute as well. And with that, we will uh, at least uh, say goodbye temporarily. So thanks, Jasmine. I think at this point, we will move along. I hope, uh, Peter, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Uh, we had some technical difficulties earlier. 
Peter, are you there? I see some bikes hanging, but I don't know if Peter is. <laughs> Let's, I think, maybe go to Denny. Are you ready with the sports report? Let's do that, and then we'll come back and see if we can find uh, Peter. Give me just a sec. Let me move the script over here, uh, buddy. All right. And, uh, hey, how about that? Here we go. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, we, we're Take all live here. Thank yep. you. First off, the report on the Nebraska and Wyoming senior games. The senior games are a program organized on local, state, and national levels, usually qualifying as local for the state games, then skate, state game placing is qualifying for the national games. The national games are held every other year. In 2019, they will be in Albuquerque, New Mexico in June. The local and state games are beginning to recognize age eligible, eligible participants and our, uh, that are riding recumbents. In some cases, they put uh, in a separate class and others- hey, Hang on a second, with, Denny. I'm sorry. We, since yeah. we jumped to you, uh, I think we kind of messed Trey up. Trey, can you uh, back up oh, a okay. few slides there and then we'll make sure that everybody yeah, sees- Yeah, you, you got me. We just All got right, Trey. now we got yeah. you. All yeah. right, yeah. I'm okay. sorry, Denny, go ahead. No, no, no problem. Uh, and in others, they compete with conventional uh, diamond frame bikes. In this year's Wyoming games, there were just two recumbents competing in the 40 and 20K road races and the 10K time trial. Our lady, Larry Seidemann, uh, managed a third in a 40K road race, and Roger, Roger Reddish rode to a fourth place in the same distance. They both competed in the 20K road race and the 10K time trial. The Nebraska Senior Games puts recumbents in their own classification. They also distinguish between two wheelers and trikes. All the participants went away with medals. Tim Cata came away with two first place finishes in the 5K time trial and the 40K road race in the two wheel recumbent division. William Self had two firsts and one second. Roger Reddish again had four first place finishes in the three wheel 70 to 74 age group. Larry Seidemann dialed in two first places and two second place finishes in a back and forth competition with William Self in the 55 to 59 age group. Esma Self was the only woman in the recumbent division and she scored victories in the 5 and 10K time trials and the 20 and 40K road race. It would be good to see more recumbents out there. The senior games are open to all fifth participants 50 years of age and older and the age divisions are in five-year incre increments. I participated at the local level a number of times on DF bike, and it's lots of fun. And Larry, uh, if you're out there, why don't you make a couple of uh, comments and a, and a pitch for it, because it's, it's one of your bags and you really, really enjoy it. I don't know, am I on? Uh, yeah, I go ahead, Larry. I'll just throw out my two cents. You don't have to be an ultra. It's not like six hours, 12 hours, they're like an hour you know, 5K, 10K, 20K time trials, road races. So you don't have to be, you don't have to be a super distance kind of person. Just get on your bike and go for a little bit. And it's a lot of fun. You're just, it's a lot of camaraderie with uh, people 50 years and older. Uh, trying to get more interest right as of right now, they won't let us in the uh, national games in Albuquerque. They're saying there's not enough interest in recumbents. So Hopefully we can get some more ground routes going from different uh, local and state races and maybe we can get in in the next uh, national games. So do whatever, Google search your local games and hopefully we'll see it some other games. That's it. All right, thanks, Larry. All right, Danny, go ahead and- Yeah, continue. yeah, and I'd like to add that uh, I know uh, locally here, it usually starts around May for uh, up here, uh, northern Pennsylvania, upstate New York for local uh, uh, competitions. And, and uh, so you might want to keep that in mind <clears throat> that uh, in order to qualify for the nationals, it's uh, uh, you have to qualify a year or two or, uh, you know, up to two years ahead of time. And uh, it's a good thing to plan for. But uh, I assume I know later on in the year in February in I think Florida's are like in October. So uh, but uh, up here, it's usually in this in the spring. Uh, a okay. real big one is in October in Utah. We get some okay. people. From, it's a real fun one because we get some people from California on the west side and then some Colorado people from the east side. And we kind of all merge together and there's about eight of us. And that's like St. George's, Utah, isn't yeah. it? It's in October, yeah, okay. St. George, Utah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I've read about it. Very good. Thanks, Larry. Um, next, I'd like to report on the race across Oregon, a 621-mile race from Ontario to Oregon, located on the Snake River in the border with Idaho, to the Pacific Ocean at Newport, Oregon. It was part of a three-person crew for Sandy Earl. Uh, Sandy is an experienced recumbent ultra racer and races under the nom de plume of Red Pearl Racing. Uh, she has a number of long distance finishes and in many of the top ultra races in the country. This year, she decided to go solo on the race and challenged Bill Spath, her significant other, to see who could finish first at Newport. Bill also has a three person crew, or had a three person crew, and there was a lot of good natured competition before and during the race. Bill had some issues with the heat and withdrew in Maupin, Oregon, um, but he gave it a good run. The course featured a number of big climbs. Indeed, there was almost 30,000 feet of elevation gain. Most of that was in big chunks. I had never been to, in Oregon and was immediately, I was impressed with the varying topography from tabletop flat and very hot to mountain passes shadowed by extinct volcanoes and near freezing temperatures. Sandy powered over all the, that the course handed her. Some of the climbs were very long with steep climbs. The temperature during the day was in the mid 90s. Sandy prevailed and became the first recumbent woman finisher in the 20 year history of the race. She finished in just over 52 hours. It was fun to be part of the race. Uh, I can't uh, emphasize, it's one of the most fun things I've done in a long time. Uh, next uh, and finally here today, uh, we just have some pre preliminary results of the Mid-Atlantic uh, 12, 24 and 100 mile race that actually finished at seven o'clock this morning uh, in uh, Washington, North Carolina for the 24 hour racers. Uh, this was from a Facebook post by Maria Parker. Uh, she, she, um, Jim and his son uh, actually were first and second on cruise bikes on the 100 mile race. Uh, so this is, uh, it's pretty good. They, the Parkers uh, always figure into this race. Uh, they race up against uh, DF people and uh, diamond frame people and, and always, always give a good account of themselves. Uh, very fast course and uh, they do it very, very well. Uh, I also see some familiar names in the recumbent world have entered. It's a flat course again, so there should be some really, really good results. Uh, and I hope to have them for next month. That's it for this month. Remember to stay on your bike and keep moving forward. Back to you, Gary. All right. Thank you very much, Danny. Great report. And uh, congrats to the cruise bike folks again. Just uh, racking up those wins uh, at various ultra races. So uh, good job uh, to those guys. All right. I think maybe we can go back to uh, Peter. Can you unmute yourself there, buddy? And uh, hey, are you there? Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. There hey. now we got Peter. So let's go ahead and let's get the history update from Peter Stahl. All oh, right. <clears throat> well, this month we're going to talk about mid drives through the ages. And a mid drive is a bike where you have, let's uh, not go to the slideshow yet. A mid drive is a bike where in the middle of the Back to me, please. Hello, hello. There, thank you. Uh, where you have in the middle of the bike, there's a, another sprocket. And here we have, where is it? I'll find it, there it is. Look at that, it's a rotator pursuit, by golly. And you'll see in the middle of this bike, let me just set this down and stop waving it around. In the middle of this bike, there is a mid-drive. So that's a mid-drive. There's a chain in the back and there's a chain in the front. And uh, that's what a mid-drive does. So uh, this, uh, the Pursuit, by the way, is a bike that it may have been uh, a bike that Brian Ball owned and reviewed. We're not positive about that, but we picked it up for the collection. It's a pretty fast, long wheelbase bike. And there's a story that uh, there was a, a solar challenge across Australia, and you were allowed to pedal and have solar. And uh, rotator, uh, uh tim delaire is it can you jump in here and help me brian tim delaire uh Mid brian is not going to be jumping anywhere well there you go okay <laughs> yeah, that's that's correct peter he, he jumped off. It? okay good thank you uh so he decided that uh his bikes were pretty quick and solar wasn't that good at that point this was probably 15 years ago or 20 years ago 
So he sent a crew with a fully uh, fared uh, rider with a fully fared rotator pursuit and added just enough solar cells and just enough motor that they could legally be considered uh, to have a solar assist. And they won basically by pedaling their butts off. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Nowadays, solar's improved. I think you'd have real trouble doing that, but they did. And they were fast bikes in the day. So now let's, I'll sit back down and we can get to the uh, slideshow. What is the mid drive there? Been there, done that. Next slide. Okay, this first, the simplest mid drive is this one where you've just got a sprocket in the front and the, then two sprockets in the middle. So it doesn't shift gears or add any gear ratios or anything, it just directs the chain. And in this bike, this is a max area. <clears throat> in this bike, the pivot of the mid drive is also the pivot of the suspension. That's supposed to prevent chain tension from affecting the uh, suspension. I don't think that's quite the perfect way to do it, but it does prevent the uh, uh, <clears throat> the chain from tensioning and detensioning when you when you go over bumps. So that's handy, and it routes the chain, and that's a neat thing. That's mainly what it does is route the chain. Uh, other ways to route the chain would be idlers. Next slide. And a lot of bikes, especially trikes, have got idlers because on a trike, you, the chain has to be careful not saw in half all these uh, transverse tubes that you have. So you have idlers to get the chain down underneath the tubes or up above the tubes. Another choice, we go to the next, uh, next slide. Another choice is this bike has chain tubes and an idler. So there are several bikes that use tubes and idlers. Some just use tubes, but it's all ways of routing the chain. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that you can have a mid drive would be to route the chain where you want it to be. But mid drives can I'd add gearing. Next slide. And this is the rotator pursuit again. You see, this has got a cassette in the middle and a cassette in the back. So it gives you a ridiculous amount of gears, which is always nice. Um, and I've been riding this one back and forth to work some. It's not a long ride and it's not particularly hilly, but I typically only shift one cassette in that ride. So it's uh, there are plenty, plenty of gears for mountain riding on that bike. Um, this is a Cannondale and this is another way to do it. And this one has a front derailleur under the seat. So there's a front, the crank set has got a single sprocket and then there's a timing chain that goes to the mid drive. And then the mid drive has got three chain rings and the front derailleur shifts back and forth and you get basically a normal gear set from a typical bicycle. Some people say that the, uh, the drive chain length in the back is the same as it would be on a traditional bike. And that's therefore the weight of chain that the derailleur is handling is, is the correct amount that Shimano or SRAM designed it for. And that's a great argument, but you know, there's some uh, bikes without mid drives that shift great. So I'm not, it's a great argument. I'm not sure that it actually holds up so much in the real world. Uh, there, now that's another one with uh, three chain rings. That's a long bike eliminator. And it has three chain rings and a drive train in the back. What's unique about this one is it has three chains. So if we start at the back, there's the chain that goes from the cassette to the three chain rings and does all your gear shifting. Then there's a middle chain that goes from there up to just behind the front fork. And then there's another chain that goes from there to the pedals, to the, to the you know, the crank, arm, crank arms. Now that's all neat and everything, but now you have to, the front two chains need to be tensioned like the timing chain in a tandem. So you, uh, you first you adjust the middle chain tension. There's a little, next, just behind the, the uh, small sprocket behind the fork. Just on the back side of that, there's a little arc shaped slot and you loosen that bolt and pivot it up a little bit to tension that chain. And after you do that, then you go forward to the front uh, crank set and the crank set has a uh, tandem elliptical bottom bracket. You can adjust that. So it's a neat idea. Mid drives do add weight to a bike. Um, the rotator, all of them, the mid drives a little bit heavier. This one with three chains is a little more heavier. Another thing that's sort of neat about a mid drive is that only one of the chains gets near your pant leg. And if you wanted to use a really clean chain lube on that chain, then you could use something that was more water resistant in the back where you weren't gonna get gooey. But uh, next slide. Now this, if you think that uh, mid drives are a, a modern thing, this is a Velocar from the thirties. 
you're familiar with uh, the racing version of this. They set a record in 33 and were promptly outlawed. This is a production road version. And if you look underneath the seat, by golly, there's a mid drive there. And it looks to me, I certainly can't tell from this picture, but it looks to me like that little vertical silver thing, white thing in the picture, uh, that looks to me like an early uh, front derailleur that operated by reaching down and grabbing the lever. The uh, Campagnolo front derailleurs had a lever instead of a cable way back in the day. And uh, so I think that that's a front derailleur, and I think we're getting some gears in the middle and the back. But there seems to be a tensioner behind the, the crank set, so I don't know what in the world's going on there. But it, it, I'd love to see one of those, and I guess there are some. Now we're back to the rotator we've talked about pretty much. Uh, notice the rotator also uses a chain tube in the front, so it keeps my pant leg nice and clean, which is a nice feature for a, a very fast bike. This is a Trek R200, and it has the mid-drive with two cassettes. This is a five-speed in the middle and eight in the back for 40 gears. But it's funny that it doesn't have a real wide range. The rotator had a very wide range. This one is not as wide as that, but uh, but it's a neat bike. Well, that'll probably be in next month also. This is a bike E. This has a mid-drive. This has three chain rings. It's an RX, or the FX was also the same the same drive. So it was a rear chain with a cassette in the back and three chain rings in the, in the middle. And then a, uh, just a timing chain in the front. Next slide. And this is a Bike Friday, Saturday. And <clears throat> it folds up and fits in a suitcase. It's probably the smallest folding production recumbent ever. Uh, I'm not positive about that, but uh, I'm open to correction. I'll bet it is, but you know, I'm open to correction. So this is kind of neat. When you pick up the back of the bike, oh, wait, can we back up one to the Saturday? There you go. Thank you. The uh, When you pick up the bike by the seat, the rear wheel doesn't swing down under it. <clears throat> because of chain tension but when you uh, when you release the chain tension and pick up the the rear of the bike that the, the uh, rear swing arm so swings underneath it there's an elastomer it rests on so it is a little suspension and it swings underneath and the mid drive idler here serves to keep the chain tensioned even while the bike is folded so that's a neat feature and it's something that uh, the some of the first folding recumbents didn't have and that's a neat feature. They that's become more popular. Most uh, most or all folding trikes now have something to keep the chain taut when you when you shift gears. Next bike. Next slide. There. This is a Cannondale. That's again three chain rings. So it's a standard drive in the back and a single drive in the front. Also has suspension. Next slide. And that's back to the long bike to eliminate. You can see the whole bike there. That's a fairly early eliminator. The pedal boom doesn't adjust in length on this one. It does on the newer ones. And uh, then the last slide is the, oh, wait, I forgot that one. Right, this is the Mikado. It was made in Cannondale by Quetzal. And it has a mid-drive, it has a front derailleur and a cassette in the middle and a cassette in the back for 105 gears. So that, if you can't climb a hill on that, there's something wrong. And it has rear suspension. And uh, it was very inexpensive. I don't think they're still made, but they were very inexpensive, at least looking at the build quality of this one. And this is, the, as far as I know, it's the only mid-drive recumbent I'm aware of that's still in the market. Someone should email me, Pete at BicycleMan.com, to point out the ones I'm forgetting. But this is a Max Area, and they're still made. They're quite a bit like an old bike E or the Cannondale. And they're still, we still stock them, and they're, they're still a nice bike. They're still in production. And that's it for this month. Thank you, Peter. That was really interesting. And uh, that's the Bicycle Man, folks. Uh, if you haven't uh, been to his shop in Alfred Station, New York, you should make the trip because it's an uh, astounding uh, experience for recumbent riders to not only go to a recumbent bike shop, but see his basically living museum. He's got so much uh, in the way of uh, history hanging from that place. So, Peter, thanks again for your efforts, and we will look forward to seeing you next month. All right. Let's go, uh, let's go to uh, talk about our sponsors one more time, if we can. First of all, our, our sponsors are TerraCycle. Check out their new website and finer recliner headrests and trailside.bike. 
If you find yourself in Florida near that with Lacucci Trail, stop in and see Andrew and his crew. And Velocity, builders of performance wheels and rims that are handmade in the USA. All right, please don't forget our uh, description section uh, below the video that will be on YouTube shortly. Uh, we've talked about we talk about it during the show, and uh, this is where we put our clickable table of contents, so that you will able, you'll be able to jump to any of the uh, different sections of each show. Uh, so you can watch what you like, or watch it in uh, in segments if you like. Uh, and uh, below the table of contents, we'll have the links that we have mentioned in the show. We're always talking about places you can uh, uh, jump to on the web to find out more information. So those links will all be also in that description right below the, the uh, video uh, screen. Uh, the next Layback Bike Report is going to be September 16th at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. I'm still nailing down exactly what we're going to do for that show. I've got a couple of good ideas. So we'll have an interesting show for you, I'm sure. Watch our uh, Facebook page uh, or Google Plus or the website uh, where I'll post that uh, probably in the next few days. You'll see what we're going to be doing next month. And now let's talk about some announcements uh, about what's going on with the Laidback Bike Report. We are heading to uh, Portland in, in late September. We're gonna meet up with this guy right here. You might have uh, you might have seen him on uh, a couple of our previous videos. This is Mel Burge from Recumbent PDX, one of the finer uh, bike shops, Recumbent bike shops in the country. Uh, Mel is putting together a trike tour of the San Juan Islands uh, and has invited uh, my wife and I. And so we are heading to Portland uh, to do that tour. And while we're there, we're also uh, going to visit with a few folks, including Sylvia Halpern, a, uh, a, a, a past, uh, uh, yep, there she is, uh, a, a past person uh, on the show, <laughs> a past striker on the show also. Uh, and we're looking forward to spending a little time with uh, Sylvia and hopefully getting some riding in uh, around the Portland area with her. And uh, another important person in Portland is uh, our buddy, Pat Franz. Uh, at TerraCycle, uh, one of our uh, biggest sponsors, uh, biggest supporters. Uh, he's he's always been a help uh, and supporter of this show. So we look forward to meeting uh, with Pat at uh, TerraCycle there in Portland as well. Also coming up uh, in October then, uh, an annual event that we just love, Recumbent CycleCon, uh, moving to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, the fairgrounds at Nashville, Tennessee this year. Um, I hope you guys will consider uh, attending Recumbent CycleCon uh, this year, if you at all can. Uh, it's your chance to meet uh, the, the Bent Industry representatives from uh, uh, all over the country and actually all over the world. You can meet them face to face if you go to CycleCon and you can test ride all the new recumbents that are there. So it's just a great place to learn more about what you might be interested in or just if you're um, interested in buying, I should say, or if you're just interested in seeing what's the latest, it's a good place to go for that as well. And new uh, this year at uh, CycleCon, they're going to have uh, an HPRA uh, race at the uh, fairgrounds uh, track uh, right uh, next door, right next door, I think, to uh, where the facility is for the, uh, the, uh, the vendor uh, show. Um, so you can uh, watch uh, the races going on or uh, the guys were talking about racing. You can actually go and race your recumbent on the track uh, uh, officially uh, if, at, during these races. So uh, check that out. And I, I believe if you uh, register for the races, that includes admission uh, to the CycleCon uh, uh, event as well. So um, we also just learned that uh, there's free admission on Sunday. Uh, to CycleCon if you pre-register. So um, I, I will put that link also in the description. And if you go there and you want to just come on Sunday, um, click on that pre-register. I think you have to do it before October 5th and uh, you will get in for free on Sunday. Uh, I was sent a, a book uh, by uh, Professor Alan Ballard. It's called uh, Keep On Moving. Uh, it's an old fellow's journey into the world of recumbent trikes, et cetera, and a few other kinds of things. And uh, Alan's a really interesting fella, and he um, he was exploring uh, what it 
takes to keep him mobile as he ages. Um, he did a very extensive review and explored all different kinds of opportunities to, uh, to keep on going. I, I love this book. It's got all kinds of pictures in it um, and uh, very well written on a, um, on a friendly kind of basis as well. So uh, if you're at all interested, uh, hop on uh, Amazon. Uh, I will also put that link below and uh, read, read Alan's book, Keep On Moving. And uh, also, we're really excited uh, to, to, to share with you that our uh, World Human Powered Vehicle uh, Championship video is out. Uh, Lars and I uh, worked very hard to, uh, to video uh, all the event that we could from above and below. Uh, that's a that's a little uh, a little picture from Lars's uh, drone video. We have lots of drone footage in it. Uh, it's got music. It's it's got excitement. It's got uh, color. It's got everything. So we hope you'll uh, you'll you'll have a look at it. It's on our YouTube page. Of course, I'll put that link there too. Everything from the trolley dash to the three-hour endurance race. Uh, it, it's it's a pretty fun video to watch, I think. So uh, this morning, I happened to uh, hop on Bent Rider and found this unsolicited testimonial from Mark Millam of Lafayette. Uh, he says. This was a truly amazing video. Best I've ever seen so far. I even bought a doggone hat. It was so good. Ha ha. But he did buy a hat. Definitely ready for prime time. So I don't know if it's ready for prime time, but it, uh, it, it, it represents uh, the best that, uh, that Lars and I could do. We hope you guys will take a look at it. Uh, we want to bring you up to date on our buddy Randy Ridings, um, who was on the show a few months back, and we talked to you about his uh, his amphibious uh, uh, quad that he pedals and was doing a uh, ride across the country. Um, Randy is now in Kansas, having come that far from the West Coast, and he's uh, getting ready to jump on the in, in the Platte River, I think. Um, he's traveled over 2,000 miles, and he's lost 30 pounds in this process. So um, I talked to I chatted with with uh, Randy uh, yesterday, and he tells me he's going to suspend his journey probably next week. He is basically running out of time. This is taking a little bit longer than he thought. So uh, he's got some obligations back home in Missouri, which he's not too far from there anyways. Um, so he's going to uh, suspend his journey for now. Uh, and uh, I think he may try to do more in bits and pieces uh, and maybe jump back on later in the fall and uh, perhaps uh, more next year. I'm sure he will complete it. In any case, I wanted to share with you that he and the Quadjack that you see right there will be joining us in our booth at the Cumbin Cycle Con uh, in October that we talked about. So um, if you're interested in what Randy has done and what he has built there, uh, come to CycleCon, come to our booth. You can see the Quadjack and you can chat with Randy's very interesting fella uh, to talk to. And he's got a billion stories uh, so far uh, from his journey. So uh, we hope you'll join us at CycleCon and, uh, and see uh, Randy and the Quadjack. All right. Uh, thanks uh, to Brian, who has uh, left us a little bit early, uh, and uh, Bent Rider for all their uh, promotional support that they give us. We appreciate that, Brian. And uh, I want to thank all my panelists for helping us uh, do this show uh, and making it uh, as fun and as successful as it is. Uh, thanks, guys, for, for doing that. And uh, let's talk a little bit about subscribing to the YouTube channel again. Uh, again, you can find that little uh, subscribe uh, uh, button in the lower right-hand corner. Click that and subscribe to our channel. Like us on Facebook. We have the Layback Bike Report Facebook page. Uh, please like that and join uh, that. You can see what's going on there on Google Plus and our website. So uh, www.laidbackbikereport.com. Uh, you can uh, type that in or uh, type uh, hit, hit that little uh, link in the yeah in the upper right hand corner that we talked about. I'll put that up there for you, and you'll be able to uh, be able to go to the website and. Uh, and see all the things that we have for you there, past shows, the bonus material, uh, contact information. You can buy a ball cap uh, like uh, Mark did uh, and, uh, and all sorts of other things. See our uh, current shows, our updated uh, information about what's coming up, uh, bonus material we add there as well. So you can sign up for our mailing list there and you can buy a hat. Uh, there's Larry Varney, our hat model. Uh, uh, just showing you what it might look like. 
So uh, 20 bucks and $5 shipping and handling will get you to get you one of the laid back bike report hats. You can find it all at laidbackbikereport.com. So thanks so much for watching everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show today. And so from all of us here at the laid back bike report, so long bent riders.